she had the wrong interpretation. She had the American Standard Bible. So this is NIV I put in my slapper. One of the most pervasive and recognizable features, I think, of our modern society today <clears throat> is the phenomenon of celebrities and influencers as leaders. You notice this here? It's kind of hard to miss here. People putting themselves out there and people being placed on a pedestal who don't have a title. They are looked up to and they are turned to. We want to hear what they have to say by virtue of how well they can play a sport or maybe how popular they are as some kind of entertainer. You have these folks serving often as leaders, even alongside those who have the titles that say they are leaders. Now, all together, very many seem to have an incredible sense of entitlement, whether it is these these so-called leaders here who, who are pushed into that position because we, we like them, we think they're popular, or whether it is those who actually are elected or have the title. Very many seem to have an incredible sense of entitlement. The news is full of stories of politicians behaving poorly. That sounds like that could be the name of a, of a TV show there. You know, TMZ tonight, politicians behaving poorly. I'm sure you can come up with a lineup every week. <clears throat> So many stories of, of behaving poorly with little regard for what the masses think. And there is a whole separate but very closely related industry devoted to following every move of our so-called so -called cultural leaders. Those who have risen to prominence and fame due, again, to that ability to play a sport or their popularity in some branch of entertainment. In fact, Many people, many people are fascinated by the lifestyle and the eccentricities that these folks have. We're, we're, we're glued to, to what they do, and we, we, we stop what we're doing to catch what they're doing. I have to say, there are lots of eccentricities with many of these folks. It's no surprise that, that many live in over-the-top ways, even traveling, just, just traveling, uh, showing up for a concert or an appearance, many have odd, odd or extravagant demands that have to be met just for them to be there. I did a little digging for fun this week. A few examples just from the music industry. I'm not going to give names, though they are recognizable names. That's not important here. But just a, a few little tidbits, some of the strange things that people demand for them to go and to be seen and to do what they are getting paid to do. One band in particular in their dressing room, there had to be a very large bowl of M&M's. That doesn't sound too crazy, right? But absolutely no brown M&M's were allowed in the bowl. Can you imagine somebody standing there pouring out bag after bag of M&M's and just sorting through and taking out the brown M&M's? Like they taste different if you close your eyes. No brown M&M's. Another pop singer uh, demands a room that must be exactly 70 eight degrees. And then there's an extensive, an extensive list of food demands on top of that, featuring, of all things, chicken legs, along with very specific directions of how they are to be prepared. Imagine going to somebody's house. Somebody invites you over to dinner, and you're coming over to their house, and you show up and say, this is what I want to eat, and you should make it this way. Just imagine that. Chicken legs. A very, very prescribed recipe. Another, another celebrity demands a humidifier in their room. Keep it at a certain uh, state of, of humidity there. Don't want it to be too much. And, and the, the room has to be draped all in blue. Hey, Grandma's coming over. Get out the blue drapes and drape them. <laughs> what? I could go on and on. I'm just giving you a few of the more tame ones. They are some pretty wild and crazy things for some of those who uh, seem to think very highly of themselves and others look to and want to know their opinion. Well, today, as we are working our way through the Old Testament, we catch up with a familiar figure, arguably one of the most recognizable of leaders in the Old Testament, but whose story points us in a different direction 
when it comes to leading than what we see all too often today. We see a very different direction, a whole different approach. Today we are going to be taking a peek at King David. Now, we're going to consider two brief little passages. David is one of the figures in the Old Testament who maybe has more written about him than any other. His story is a very large one. It occupies a lot of space in the Old Testament. We're going to key on two particular parts you see in your bulletin. Let's begin, if you want to open up your Bibles or follow along on the screen, to 2 Samuel chapter 5 with verses 1 through 5. 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel in their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their, leader, their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. This is the word of the Lord, and I speak to God. How many of you remember a little while back, it hasn't been that long, the coronation of Charles, King of England? How many of you remember that coronated king over England after his mother, Queen Elizabeth, died? If you tuned in at all, you saw some kind of spectacle, didn't you? Now, there were claims made, there were claims made that he was keeping it simple. He wanted it to be a little bit simple and and downplayed, but still, there was more pomp and circumstance than you could shake two or three sticks at with that event. Here, in 2 Samuel, David being made king over Israel really is almost a matter of fact. It's so simply stated. There is no description of the setting, what it looked like, how it was decked out, how it was draped. There's no description of the ceremony or the clothes or the crown or really anything. Really all there is is the people say, we want you to be king because God said so. That's really about it. Now if you know David's story, you know that is important. That they wanted him to be king because God said so. You know that's important because nobody, nobody would have expected David to be king. No one would have even thought when he was born that he could be king. We like to tell kids today, you can be anything you want when you grow up. Nobody would have thought that David could be king. Growing up, Saul was the king. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. David was of the tribe of Judah. He was not in any way, shape, or form in, in any line of succession if you considered Saul as king. Now, David's father is a shepherd, and so David by default, and guess what? He's a shepherd too. And he wasn't the oldest. It's not like he stands to inherit, he stands to come into you know, a spread here when Pop dies. No, he's the eighth child, the eighth son. Will anything be left for him? But when Saul disobeyed God and displeased God, that God said enough, God told the prophet Samuel to go and to anoint David to be king. Now, it took a while. It took a while after that. There were ups and there were downs. There were twists and there were turns. David was first noticed, you probably know this story, first noticed by the king, by the people, when he defeated the giant Goliath, when he slayed the giant with a little rock there and cut off his head. And then after that came service to the king and the growth as a warrior and a leader. God was preparing David for the role that he had in mind for him. Here today we see when David went from a regional tribal leader or a, a little king, if you will, to king over all 
over all of Israel. It's a big moment indeed. What stands out though is not the manner in which he was made king, but the purpose or the charge that he had in being king. David didn't have to cast a vision for what his kingship would look like. There was no, uh, no, nobody from the Jerusalem Times interviewing, what do you hope to accomplish in office? No, no. David did not have to cast a vision of what it would be like with him king because God gave him. If you had your Bibles open, in verse 2 there it says, The Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and become their ruler. Now we don't have an exact verse for that when God said that to David. We don't have a verse that records this, but clearly the people... The people as a whole now see what was said of David when he was anointed by Samuel. When he was anointed by Samuel, it says that the Spirit of the Lord was with him. So they didn't hear the words, you will shepherd my people and you will be their ruler. They didn't hear those words. They didn't, they didn't see the moment when he was anointed, but they certainly are seeing the effect of David being anointed, and they understand that he is of God. If you read David's story, if you read David's story, he was not, he was not the perfect leader. He failed badly a number of times. But for the most part, the one said to be a man after God's own heart sought to honor God and carry out God's will throughout his life. And we often see that he did honor God, not think of self first. Again, he was not perfect, but his life is one where we can see a man striving after God. This is seen quite clearly early on when David sets out to bring the ark of God into Jerusalem. If you would like to uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6 or follow on the screens, let's see what it says about this moment here. Chapter two, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, 1 through 5. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of, the cup of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Benadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Aho, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. What do we have here? We have the most powerful man in all of Israel recognizing that there is one more powerful than he. He David, king over all of Israel, is only a middleman when it comes to the true leadership of Israel. And here we see he does what he can to lead Israel following God, bringing the ark into the capital where it will be the center of attention and, and all of their life together will be centered on it. As a shepherd who became king, David knows what it means to shepherd, it means to care, and it means to protect and provide. A shepherd king, leading God's people, then David, I think, points to Jesus, the leader who has absolutely no peer, the one who is power and authority in the flesh whose care for his people was carried out finally in his willing sacrifice of his own life. If we allow David to point us to Jesus, from a great but a flawed leader to the perfect leader, from the one who sought the heart of God, 
to the one who brought the heart of God to earth, we better understand what David was to be about, what it means to shepherd. It doesn't get much plainer than we find in Mark chapter 10 or Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he said, even the Son of Man, that's he himself, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. If we back up a verse or two, we back up a verse or two in Mark 10 or Matthew 20, we, we get an even clearer picture of what it means to care and to serve. I'd like to read for you from Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 42. Now, before I read this, just let me note, just let me say here, Jesus says what I'm about to read. He says this after James and John, the two of his closest disciples, were asking Jesus for special treatment. Remember this? This is where they said, hey, when you come into your glory, can we sit at the right and the left hand? This is what Jesus says now is after you see these two that Jesus had called to special service, asking for special treatment. Jesus says this. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who were regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You read these words or you hear these words, you think of David called to be king, to shepherd his people. We, we understand the way of Jesus is very, very different from the way of the world. Jesus doesn't just talk a good game. He really does care. He really does serve. He really does put himself on the line. He serves those. He cares for those. He protects those. He provides for those that he would lead. We see this over and over throughout the Gospels with stories where Jesus fed people. 5,000 and 4,000 stories where he healed. He healed the lame. He healed the blind. He healed the deaf. He healed those who were paralyzed and lepers and on and on. We see this in the Gospels when we read about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We see this in the Gospels when we see Jesus casting out evil spirits to set people free. Ultimately, we see Jesus caring, shepherd, leadership when he goes to the cross. If David, if David was to lead by caring, by shepherding, and, and he did okay by spells, Jesus is our example. He is the one that we want to follow in every way we possibly can. I don't think it gets any clearer or any better stated than what Paul says when he writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is 
above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now I'm painting quite a picture for you here, yes? You might think, Pastor, I'm not David. I'm, I'm no leader. How many of you would say, I'm a leader? Boy, that, that's a pretty resounding no. Well, maybe you're not the leader of a country, even a small one. But all who claim Jesus as Lord have a call on their lives to live in such a way that others might be pointed or led to Christ. Now, there's no guarantees that the one that you are witnessing to will actually accept, but our lives have a purpose that, among other things, does include care or shepherding like David. And it should not be confined to narrow bits and pieces of our lives, to a person here or a person there. You and I, called by God, anointed, if you will, by the Holy Spirit, have to see, while we may be under authority, really maybe layers and layers of authority, not just under God as David was, we all, all of us have a responsibility toward others, really toward all, to lead by example, loving every way we can, for everyone we can, one way or another, they are all, all God's people. Everyone you will ever come in contact with, whether the world sees or remembers you in any way, that is our charge, to love extravagantly, to love unconditionally, to love unceasingly. And whether the world sees or remembers you in any way, to learn from David, to live following the teaching and the example of Jesus, will make you 